I just finished recording this video and I realized that I should start it actually with a list of the books that you should read. So here's the list. Write this list down or, or take a screenshot or whatever. These are the books. And the rest of this video is just a discussion of these books. Okay? Okay, let's get started. People have been asking me for a while to tell them what novels to read. Hmm? I keep saying that, you know, in the, in the great 19th century novelist, there are so many human truths that you can find. And so they've asked me, you know, what novels should I read then? Okay, so this video, I'm going to talk about specifically what novels you should read, hmm? which writers you should read, and why. Why these guys that I'm going to tell you about and everybody else you should just ignore. Well, or, or why should you pay more attention to these guys that I'm going to tell you? Because there are good reasons, right? And with every truth, see, if you cannot explain why something is true, then you have to re-examine it, then because it might not be true. You see what I mean? I can wholeheartedly say that the novels I'm going to tell you to read are the ones to read. And I can give you good reasons, and so let's just get started. The first thing you have to understand is why you are reading novels full stop. The reason you are reading novels is because they can teach you about human behavior because the great novels were written by men who paid attention to other human beings, who looked at them, examined them as if under a microscope. And they related in sometimes very good prose and sometimes kind of crappy prose how human beings actually are. Now this information, this knowledge that you can glean from novels, from the great novels, right, will serve you well for the rest of your life. You will be able to find people who correspond to the great novels that you have read about. Yeah, and it's really crazy, but it's true. You will read Dostoevsky, you will read Chekhov, you will read whomever, and as you grow older, you'll come across people and you'll say, oh, this is just like that guy from Uncle Vanya. Or this is just like uh, Alyosha or Ivan from the Brothers Karamazov. You, you will see them replicated in real life. You will see the characters that you read about walking around and talking and acting as if they were real. <laughs> because they are. That's the beauty of these great writers. So anyway, enough of me going on and on about these great writers, whom I love very much, right? Let's talk about Nitty Gritty. Who should you read? Well, the first one is the big D, Dostoevsky. The first novel that you should read by Dostoevsky is Notes from Underground. Oh yeah, Notes from Underground is the perfect introduction to not just Dostoevsky, but to all the literature I'm going to be discussing in this, in this video. Okay, Notes from Underground is the first person narration by an unnamed narrator who is He's not totally crazy, he's kind of crazy, but you start to realize as you read the book that he has been so isolated, he is so alone, he is so lonely that he's gone a little bit nuts, but he's not totally nuts, right? And that's the thing about him. And you read him and you see how human he is. And I remember when I read him when I was, I don't know, I must have been, I want to say 17 or 18, and I was so struck by how human he was and how much I identified with him. And something else too is that, see, I read him and I realized that um, Salinger, J.D. Salinger's uh, Catcher in the Rye was, for all intents and purposes, a copy of Notes from Underground. Of course, Notes from Underground was written in 1860, whereas uh, Catcher in the Rye was written 90 years later. Hmm? And frankly, Catcher in the Rye is a good book when you don't know much about literature. But when you read a lot, when you've read enough, you look at um, Catch in the Rye and you look at Notes from Underground and you realize Notes from Underground is far more, far better, quite frankly, far better, far truer, far more humane, far more real. I mean, that's the thing about Notes from Underground. You read, read it and it's so real. God damn. But Notes from Underground isn't the only great Dostoevsky novel. There are a bunch, actually, but the ones that I would highlight, the ones that I would read in this order, would be Notes from Underground, The Idiot, The Brothers Karamazov, 
demons, and finally, crime and punishment. Now, why this order? Actually, now that I think about it, I would go Notes from Underground and then The Brothers Karamazov. The Brothers Karamazov is his longest novel, his final novel, right? But it's actually the most readable. It's a book that just gallops along. The Brothers Karamazov is about four brothers. The Brothers Karamazov with the title, of course. There's uh, Ivan, Alyosha, um, Smerdyakov, and, and what was the other one? Oh, he slips my mind. I'll remember it later, but I'll probably remember it after I'm done with the video, but that's not important. See, it's about these four brothers and their relationship with their father. And of course, their father is murdered. He's murdered by Smerdyakov, who's the bastard son of the old man, uh, 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 old man Karamazov, right? But to see, all of the other brothers, though they did not participate in the murder, they sort of inspired and manipulated and almost cajoled Smerdyakov into doing the actual crime. And it's about the relationship between men, between men and their father. Uh, it's just full of life. And for me to try to describe it here is just a little bit of a waste of time. Read the book. That's the second book by Dostoevsky you should read. Notes from Underground, The Brothers Karamazov, then read The Idiot. Then Demons. Demons is a great book. Demons, shit, the people who should be reading Demons are, of course, Antifa. Oh, yeah. Antifa should be reading that because, see, Demons is about the Antifa of the 19th century. Yeah. These um, political crazies who at the time were called nihilists, who did all kinds of stupidity, right? I'm not going to get into it now. But again, see, these novels, what do they portray? What does Dostoevsky do in these novels? He gives each of his characters a clear psychological type and a clear psychological background. And then he just lets these characters run around and collide with one another. They, they smash into one another and you see the sparks fly and you see how these different kinds of people, these different kinds of, of, of psychological makeups interact. And it's startling because what happens is that see, all of these novels were written in the 1860s and 70s, right? And yet 150 odd years later, they're still relevant. You read uh, 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 The Brothers Karamazov, you read The Idiot, you read uh, 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 Demons, you read Crime and Punishment, and you understand the characters because those characters are human beings and human beings, they don't change. That's why Dostoevsky, he's the number one guy that you should be reading. The second guy you should be reading is Anton Chekhov. Now, Anton Chekhov is actually not a novelist. He's a playwright, of course. And he wrote some fantastic uh, uh, work that, again, is all about people. It's all about human psychology. It's all about how people interact and how their selfish desires clash with their desire to be good people and help one another, right? But the selfishness sometimes win and sometimes the selfishness is submerged by altruism, by a desire for goodness, by a desire for grace. Now, Chekhov, I would say, is not so psychologically astute as Dostoevsky or, or, or not as great a psychologist as Dostoevsky, right? But Chekhov shows something that sometimes eludes Dostoevsky because Dostoevsky is so trying to be psychologically real, psychologically true, that sometimes he misses out on what Chekhov captures so well, which is the desire of all human beings to strive towards something higher, for a higher purpose in life. To not just simply act out of psychological impulses, but rather to strive towards greatness, greatness in a spiritual sense. Even though Dostoevsky was a, uh, was a religious believer, Anton Chekhov captures that a little, bit, a little bit tighter, especially in plays like, well, there were the four major plays. There was um, The Cherry Orchard, there was uh, Uncle Vanya, the Three Sisters, and uh, what was the fourth one? It's slipping my mind now, but the point. These four plays are the ones that you should read. And I would suggest you start with Uncle Vanya. And if you're lazy or, or you're a little bit intimidated by reading this stuff, what you should really start, insofar as Chekhov is concerned, is this great film made in the early 90s called Vanya on 42nd Street. 
Now, this movie was directed by Louis Malle. Uh, Louis Malle was a famous uh, French film director. He's very good. And the film is beautiful, beautifully acted and all the rest of it. And uh, what it is, is actually what it is, the movie is about how uh, uh, Andre Gregory, a theater director, gathers a bunch of actors in an abandoned theater to stage an adaptation of Uncle Vanya. Now, the text in the movie is a translation made by David Mamet. And uh, it's a very good uh, production, of course. But the movie, all the actors are dressed in regular contemporary street clothes, like current day, today street clothes, right? And yet the, the play is set in the 19th century. And yet somehow, and, and this is the genius of Chekhov, right? With all due respect to, uh, to uh, Louis Malle as the film director and uh, Andre Gregory as the director of the play within the movie, th this comes from Chekhov, the brilliance that, see, even though they are dressed in clothes of the 1990s, you are instantly transported into the world of the 1860s, I believe the play is set in, right? And yet, even though you are transported into that past milieu of Russia, and, and a country house in Russia where the action takes place, you even forget about that as you see the psychology of the characters and their aims and desires. The movie is beautiful. It's beautiful, a wonderful picture, okay? It's a wonderful movie and it captures the brilliance and beauty of the play Uncle Vanya. So read Uncle Vanya and read uh, The Cherry Orchard, oof, that's a, it's, it's about how the middle class rise up and how the old aristocracy, the old people in control, no longer have the moral fiber, the moral strength to maintain. Uh, very, um, uh, it, it's relevant to what's going on today. The Cherry Orchard, Uncle Vanya, Three Sisters, and what was the name of the fourth play? It just slips my mind. You're probably seeing it now. I'm probably putting it up on the video. Read that play too. Okay, even though I've forgotten it because, you know, Alzheimer's, I'm telling you, Chekhov, Anton Chekhov, all the way. And then, of course, we come to the third big Russian, which is Tolstoy. Yeah, Leo Tolstoy, Count Leo Tolstoy. A lot of people think that he is the greatest novelist of all time. I respectfully disagree, but he's up there. Okay, the novel you should start with insofar as Tolstoy is concerned is The Death of Ivan Ilyich. That is a novel that I remember reading it when I was 20 and I re read it and I realized that this writer could capture the notion of death, what it feels like to no longer exist. And that's the power of Tolstoy. He is able to put you into a mental state like few other writers have ever been able to do, okay, of, of any language. Even in a bad Tolstoy translation, you're going to get into the psychic space. And you read The Death of Ivan Ilyich, which is a very short novel, his shortest novel probably. And you'll get a sense of Tolstoy. He is this big presence. He is a little bit like a God. And he's sort of like played up to that, okay? He had this attitude that, yes, I am the God of my fictional universe and I'm going to stride across it as such. Yeah, he, he's got that thing going, that whole God complex going, but he tells you things that are true about human existence. So the, the first novel you should read is Ivan Ilyich, The Death of Ivan Ilyich by Leo Tolstoy. The second Tolstoy novel you should read is Anna Karenina. Anna Karenina is a powerful novel about domesticity, about the potential unhappiness of domesticity. It, it opens with the most famous line in literature, practically. He says, all happy families are all alike, but every unhappy family is different. Yeah, that's very, very true, you know? Uh, and Anna Karenina is about marriage. It's about domesticity. It's about the constraints of domesticity and how those constraints can be elevating and yet at the same time destructive. And it's a very powerful novel. The problem with uh, Tolstoy is that he tends to idealize and, and, and make into a Mary Sue a certain kind of woman. Not quite a Mary Sue, but he tends to idealize a certain kind of petite blonde woman, right? Because this was his idealization of the perfect woman. And he kept inserting this perfect woman in just about every book that he ever wrote, right? But like the fiery central character of Anna Karenina, the, the namesake character, right? She is powerful, fiery, impulsive, 
very wise, very awake, very foolish, and ultimately her end is tragic. And, and of course, it's a great novel because of it, because as you see her fate develop, as you see what her choices lead her to, you see not just the effects on herself, but the effects on everybody around her. And it's a powerful novel. And then after, the, after that, you should read War and Peace uh, or The Kreutzer Sonata. The Kreutzer Sonata is a short novel. So yeah, The Kreutzer Sonata, that would be a great novel. It's still controversial. Over 140 odd years after it was written, The Kreutzer Sonata is still controversial. That should say something about it. And as to War and Peace, <coughs> excuse me, War and Peace is a great novel. It's a huge novel, right? But it's a little bit cold. Mm -hmm. It is a great novel and it shows the Napoleonic uh, conquest of Russia in the War of 1812 and all that. But, but, great though it is, it, it, it teaches about people, but not as much as the other books, okay? War and Peace is an important book for Russia. It's an important book for Russian literature and the Russian national psyche. But insofar as understanding people, yeah. which is what the, the whole point of this video is about, it's about books that will teach you about people. It's Ivan Ilyich, Anna Karenina, The Kreutzer Sonata. And if you got time, read War and Peace. Yeah, but you're gonna need a lot of time to read that monster. Oh yeah. Now another playwright who's worth reading that is sort of like, he teaches you a lot about people, but at the same time, he's sort of like on the limit. Okay, and I'll explain this limit in just a moment, but see, the, the one that you should read also, but is not as important as the others I've already mentioned, is Henrik Ibsen. Now, Henrik Ibsen wrote a series of remarkable plays. Uh, they're all quite brilliant, and yet, you know, some of them are more valuable than others insofar as this project that I'm telling you is concerned. The plays that you should read by Ibsen are um, Ghosts and most especially Enemy of the People. Enemy of the People is, is a remarkable play. It was written in 1880, I want to say, something like that. And it was a reaction to the criticisms he received for Ghosts. Because Ghost was a very realistic uh, uh, play that um, talked about a whole bunch of very scandalous things. You know, basically uh, um, about incest, uh, adultery, venereal diseases, all kinds of stuff like that. Th th things that at that time were kind of taboo. And it caused a lot of scandal. And as a reaction to it, Ibsen wrote a play called The Enemy of the People. And it it's really interesting because in the play you could tell that originally he wanted to set the main character as this put upon figure, right? Because in the play, An Enemy of the People, it's about this character, and I forget the name of the guy, it's some Norwegian name or whatever, but the character, right, he is a doctor at a spa, and the, the waters of the spa are poisoned, right? And he, he, as the play opens, he's discovered this, and he decides that he's going to tell everybody the truth, right? The, the truth of what he has discovered which is kind of like what you'd think that Ibsen would think of himself insofar as uh, bringing the truth of adultery, venereal disease, incest, and all the rest of it that he brought with ghosts. Because everything in ghosts is very human. It's very true. It's, it's true of the human condition, right? And so Ibsen wrote this play, The Enemy of the People, and the central character was this doctor who, like I said, finds out that the waters of the spa of his town are poisoned. And this is very important because, see, the, the town depends on the business that the spa brings in. And if it turns out that the waters of the spa are poisoned, then people aren't going to go to that spa, and so the town is going to suffer because of it. Now, he has this truth, right? But what's interesting and, and what's remarkable about the play is that, see, the doctor insists on telling everybody the truth, but Rather than try to work with the people of the town, the mayor of the town, uh, the owner of the local tannery that is poisoning the water, uh, working with the people to come up with a solution to this problem, he insists on going out there and insulting everybody and shitting on everybody, right? To show that he is right and everybody else is a fool. 
Who does that remind you of? Huh? And there are some other plays by Ibsen that I have serious problems with, principally uh, Doll's House. Uh, Doll's House is, you know, supposed to be a feminist play and what have you. I think it's a crock of shit, to tell you the truth. The first two acts of A Doll's House are remarkable. I mean, brilliant, right? The third act, the final act, is a bit of a fucking disaster, right? And the end is just so much bullshit, okay? But that's not uh, important for this conversation. What's important here is that Ibsen, in The Enemy of the People, right, he is delineating a psychological type. He is delineating somebody that you probably know quite well if you're watching my videos, right? Which is, you know, the guy who knows the truth, but rather than try to slide in that truth so that people accept it and embrace it, he uses that truth as a bludgeon to hit people. And of course, nobody likes being hit. And, and what happens to the, the, the guy, the, the titular character, the enemy of the people, this doctor? Well, what happens is that he becomes socially isolated because instead of trying to slide in the truth and help people understand and help them not only understand but come to a solution because the key issue of the play is that a solution is possible, right? But this man, he is so obsessed with bludgeoning people with the truth that he becomes completely isolated and the people keep on going to the spa, they keep on getting poisoned at the spa, right? And he is isolated. Uh, think of it. Think of the, 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 the psychology of the character, right? And that's what's brilliant about the play. And that's what's brilliant about Ibsen. See? Because it teaches you something about people. And that play in particular, and uh, the enemy of the people, that most especially. Now, I've mentioned a few writers, and I've told you specifically what to read, right? Now, you're probably getting the idea that all of the stuff that I'm re recommending is from over 100 years ago. And you're probably asking me, you know, why not something more relevant, quote unquote, something more recent? And the answer is quite simple. You see, because in the 19th century, and, and I can actually pinpoint the moment, it was with Madame Bovary, the great novel by Gustave Flaubert, right? At that moment, we had modernism. Now, what was modernism? The, the notion of modernism in literature, in, in novels. Well, it was the notion that form was more important the form, how something was written, the structure of it, was more important than the characters. The characters became secondary. And this uh, evolution, if you want to call it, I personally think it's a devolution. Well, that started with Madame Bovary. Madame Bovary was the great French novel written, I believe, in 1866 by Gustave Flaubert. It's really the only really great novel that he wrote. He wrote some other shit, but... Madame Bovary was it. It's beautifully written, beautifully structured, and for those of you who don't know, it's about the character, the title character, Madame Bovary, who is this flighty, silly woman. She is flighty and she is silly, and quite frankly, she's a bit stupid. And because of this, and because of her impulsivity, she does a whole host of things, of little misadventures that lead to tragedy. Tragedy for herself and to all the people around her. And because of her foolishness, she it just creates a mess, a mess of everybody's lives, right? And it, it's a fascinating character study. It's very human, just like the other writers that I was mentioning. But the difference and why Madame Bovary is key is because uh, uh, Gustave Flaubert devoted an enormous amount of time to how he wrote Madame Bovary. He slaved over every sentence, every paragraph, every page, right? It took him years to write the book, right? And it is a great novel in a formal sense, in a human sense, in a psychological sense. It's all right. It's not bad, but the others are better. But see, what happened was that literature, as opposed to following the example of Dostoevsky, who was kind of like a, slop, a sloppy writer, but he was very psychologically astute, extremely psychological student. His characters are, are, are like full, they feel alive, right? That's the greatness of Dostoevsky, right? But he was a sloppy writer. Well, people after uh, uh, Madame Bovary, after Gustave Flaubert, they started paying more attention to the form. Form became everything. And you can see it quite easily. You look at the great writers who came after uh, uh, Gustave Flaubert, who, by the way, Gustave Flaubert, published Madame Bovary the same year 
that Dostoevsky published Crime and Punishment. But Western literature followed Madame Bovary, and we got, as an example, as, as, as descendants, rather, of this formalism, we got Henry James, we got Ernest Hemingway, we got William Faulkner, we got James Joyce, we got then the postmodernists, right? We got, uh, what, uh, Thomas Pynchon, we got Don DeLillo, right? Uh, John Updike, I forgot about him, yeah, John Updike, you know, he was called by uh, Alan Bloom, he was called a, um, uh, a third-rate novelist with a first-rate prose style, which basically captures the problem, see? Everybody became so concerned about writing beautifully that they no longer wrote humanely. They no longer wrote about human beings. They wrote beautiful fluff, beautiful bullshit, you see? And that's why the 20th century novelists and the 21st century novelists, you know, they're, they're laughable, they're trivial, they're stupid and pathetic because they're not talking about human beings, right? All the writers I've discussed so far, they wrote about people. Some of them, like Dostoevsky, like Tolstoy even, they were sometimes sloppy in their writing. Yeah, sometimes they broke all kinds of rules that today would have people at MFA programs outrage, outrage that they'd done such a thing, right? But they didn't give a shit. They didn't care about formal rules because what they cared about was capturing the human experience. This is why you have to read these writers because they consciously wanted to capture what it was to be a human being. And even in their minor characters, uh, these uh, writers like Tolstoy, like Dostoevsky, like um, Chekhov and Ibsen, they want to capture the reality of existence of what human beings are actually like. Hmm? Now that's the whole point of reading a novel, right? That's the whole point of reading narrative prose fiction. Hmm? And yeah, I mean, like in, in this uh, little video, I've told you, talked to you about two actual novelists and two playwrights, but you should read them. These are the guys that you should read. This is where you should start. You start with these guys and you're going to start to realize how much bullshit contemporary writers actually are. You're going to start to realize how unimportant their work actually is. Okay. Now, I'm not talking about like, like commercial writers who are just writing entertainments. That, that's perfectly respectable. I used to be such a writer. I published novels, thrillers, that were just to entertain people. I didn't have any ambitions to be a great writer. I had ambitions to entertain people and may, hopefully make a shit ton of money for myself, right? But see, the serious novelists, the serious writers of today, and frankly of the last 130 odd years, I would say, they don't care about people. They care about impressing one another. They care about writing uh, uh, beautiful prose, but not writing insightfully, truthfully about people. Mm -hmm. Now you should understand this, and that's why you should read these books that I've recommended. These are the books that matter. And then after that, you just keep on reading and you'll figure it out on your own.